that's that saves us from a lot of problems. Anyway, um, I guess I got a few minutes for the official time here. And there's still always lots of news. Ah, good. So some people got the time change correctly. So, oh yeah, I thought this one might be worth mentioning. Port smash. Um, and in spirit of what you were saying, this one's kind of fun. And I think I'll just do those. So this is the latest vulnerability. This is coming from Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, when the Spectre and Meltdown came out and they said the speculative execution is a serious problem, they said, you know, we're not going to find all the vulns. They're going to just keep coming because until you replace the hardware, all we can do is block particular paths to the problem and there will just be more and more paths appearing. And so here's another one that I've heard years ago. Multi-threading is a similar problem to speculative execution. You have two threads of code executing on the same hardware at the same time, and you could have one being high privilege and one being low privilege. And if you take the CISSP, this is the non-interference principle of security. For a security system, is supposed to have non-interference, which means that the low privilege system is not affected in any way by what the high privilege system is doing. But if they're both running on the same hardware, that is probably not true. And of course, it's not true. So they found ways to take the timing is the most obvious one. The, the low privilege process is able to deduce what the high privilege process is doing. And that means you can, in shared cloud environments, you can steal the secrets, break into other people's machines and all that good stuff. They managed to keep it quiet until this particular one was fixed. But just like the other one, it is a fundamental problem with the hardware. The people that found it said you have to quit doing hyperthreading. And Intel said, oh, no, no, we can't possibly do that. You have to patch it at some other level. And so there, no, the particular one is fixed, but the people that found it say there's just going to be a whole bunch more coming because this is a fundamental logical flaw with your system. But just like speculative execution, it is so much more productive that the hardware manufacturers are very reluctant to give up this productivity feature and they're high hoping to find some way to patch it outside that. So this is pretty much madness. So the EFF is trying to sue the NSA for illegal spying, which they certainly did. And the NSA is trying to squirm out of it by any means possible. So their latest thing is there's a, in order for you to have standing, and you're going to have a document submitted as evidence, somebody with personal knowledge of the document has to attest that that document is genuine. And the NSA is refusing to attest that the documents are genuine or to let any of their staff do that because they're secret, so they can't get anybody to test it, it's open. So now they have Snowden on the lam in Russia standing up to give legal right to the documents in America by saying that he saw them and they're real, which is kind of nuts. But that's the, he's the guy attesting that the documents are real. So let's see, are these port smash theoretical? Uh, the port smash is not theoretical. There is a real exploit. I don't think they've released the exploit code yet, but it, they gave proof of demonstration months ago and Intel, actually, or not Intel, but some other company actually put out a patch. So there is, um, it's, no, the, it's real. Um, it's a good question. Anyway, so that's kind of madness that a guy that's uh, pretty much on the lam is testing that something is true. And this one I thought was pretty good. Elsevier is, so all, pretty much all scientists hate Elsevier. You work, you, you have publicly funded research, you work for years and discover something, then you want to publish it, you must publish in certain famous journals or your publication will not count towards getting tenure or anything. And you cannot even publish in those journals without paying like $1,000 per page to publish. And then you can't even subscribe to them without paying like $10,000 a year to subscribe to it. So this is a way of keeping all science only for elite rich people at famous colleges and all. Everybody else can't even read the results they paid for. And many, many people are disgusted by this, and they just dump their stuff on the internet. But if you do that, faculty review at colleges will not count it as a real publication. Because it doesn't go through this peer review process, which has been totally debunked as completely fake. What any, many spectacular demonstrations were made, including a few years ago, somebody wrote a computer program that just mixed together phrases and created garbage papers, and a bunch of them passed the peer review process and got published. So the idea that they're actually quality controlling them has been debunked. So anyway, Elsevier, in Sweden, they don't support this, so they let you go to the sites that steal the papers and put them up there. This is what the famous guy um, that killed himself at MIT, a student, released a bunch of Elsevier protected documents on the web, Aaron Schwartz. And when they came to him, they were going to lock him up for 30 years for copyright violations, so he committed suicide. But anyway, uh, what the Swedish ISP did was when they sent them a court order and forced them to block 
uh, the pirate Elsevier sites, they also block Elsevier. So anybody wants to talk to these people before you even go there, I'm going to tell you what bums these people are. Let them see how they like being blocked. So anyway, it's a huge argument. It's a huge bitter battle in the world of science right now. Anyway, we are here at 127. I should mention the schedule, which has become kind of erratic, and it's going to continue to be kind of erratic as we have uh, cyber competitions getting in the way, and this is our glorious DNS that does not work, slowing everything down here. Um, I will get my local copy while this network is useless. All right. If I can find the right class. Okay. There, there's my local copy. Oh, this finally moved, of course. All right. Is that one going to move? Okay. So, um, let me mute people and try to keep that junk off the screen. All right. Um, all right. This thing is just a turn to cover the screen with junk. All right. So, um, anyway, so today we meet at 140, and next week at 3, then we're back to 1 o'clock and then back at 3 on this day. So watch. I don't think there'll be a guest speaker here. I think we'll just move, I'll move the last topic up to here. Um, there aren't too many guest speakers that want to come in on Saturday this semester. It varies randomly. Anyway, so um, the main thing today is protection mechanisms, and I'm very happy about this one. I've got a lot of new material and a couple new projects to go with it because of the wonderful new low-weight C compiler that Microsoft has given us so we can actually compile test programs much more easily than before. And this Zoom is just determined to keep throwing junk on the screen. I'll just have to keep swatting away like a room full of flies. Anyway, um, there may be some way to tell Zoom to stop corrupting the screen. If anybody figures it out, please let me know. I'm just, however, it's free. Uh, I would make this big if I could hit the right key presses, which I apparently can't. All right. After Zoom gets me off track, I, I must do this. There should be a show option. Play. Play. Okay, it's diagonal crooked thing with a symbol means nothing to me. Clover, leaf, and pea. Does not work. All right. Higher. Okay, diagonal clover, leaf means alt. I, I wish they would use English or something. Anyway, so... All right, so uh, we'll talk about the non-executable stack, a big defense. This is, Microsoft calls this data execution prevention, and they have the policy of write or execute, and then stack canaries, about which we can do a lot more than I ever have in the past. We can watch them in action, and the stack layout, armored address space, and ASLR, uh, quite a few of these are very easy to see now that we can make simple C++ code and compile it with Windows switches. So we'll talk about this stuff. Uh, the, these are the protection mechanisms. Um, there are two kinds of protection mechanisms. Some of them are hardening the operating system so that even if you run old code, you'll be safer. That's nice. Often that is not possible, and a lot of the protections will only apply to new code that is compiled with a later version of the compiler. And as you can see, that's, that's similar to, say, Spectre and Meltdown. What can you do without fixing the hardware? Well, you can do something, but it's not as much as actually fixing the problem, like recompiling code so it no longer has the fundamental weakness. Um, so here's simple C code. So you have a function here, in comes an argument, and there's uh, various local variables on the stack, var1, buff, and var2. So if it just puts them on the stack in the order in which the uh, programmer declared them, you'll have variable2, buffer, variable1, then you'll be done storing local variables. Then you'll have the saved EVP and the saved return address. And this is, of course, what we've been doing. You take that buffer and you overrun it past 80 bytes, and then you can change the saved return address and take over the machine. So one defense is a non-executable stack. Um, this way, if you have injected code onto the stack and then try to jump to it, even if you're able to overrun the buffer and take over the EIP, this, it will not run because that stack is marked non-executable. You can still overwrite the return address, but you cannot run code that you injected. And uh, so the cure, of course, is to move into the text section, which is we're gonna see is not randomized by SLR. So the code remains in a fixed place and you can find it. So you could do various things. And well, here's one solution is to put your shell code in the data section. The data section is um, used to store other things than what goes on the stack. And it may, if that has a predictable address, you can go there. 
you can return to Lib C. This was, I think, the first version of um, return-oriented programming. You go to a library C function call, and the library C should always be in a fixed location. You run to that code, so you can run something like system and open a command prompt or things like that. Um, all right. That's the game here. Of course, again, you can't inject a null byte typically because you're going through strings, but still, this is quite useful. Return to string copy is really quite cute. You put the shell code on the stack. It just sits there. It's not executable, but you return to the library function string copy, which co copies it somewhere, and string copy copies code somewhere and returns a pointer to it. So you don't need to know where it is, and it's in another segment. So that's pretty cute. Um, so uh, here's return to string copy. You um, you take your injected stuff and you move it here, and the destinations will appear on the stack, and you can use them to jump to it. So that's fun. You can return to get s. This will now return and run a function that takes input from the user. So then you can just type in your exploit, and it will end up in memory. You can run it. Um, there's all right. The joy of return to gets, you'll just inject gets onto here, and when it tries to return to the subroutine, it will return to gets and run the gets function. Yeah, and so in general, you can return to code. Uh, this is the way all uh, return-oriented programming works. You return to code that's already there, and then you paste together code to do whatever you want. If you're lucky enough to have a simple C function that does something directly useful, you might only need to call one piece of return-oriented code, otherwise you have to build a rock chain from little bits. And that's chained ret to code, um, where you're gonna have to jump to a routine and after each one, you're gonna have to do something like pop, pop, return to get to the next one. So you'll have to build these things. Um, find places where there's a pop, pop, places where there's another pop, pop, and so on, to add it all together. You can return to any syscall as well. It's another way to do it. Um, or you pop the registers. Remember, it's syscall. All you have to do is have the right parameters and say EAX and EBX and then call syscall. And you could find something that puts it in EAX, something that puts it in EBX, then jump to syscall and simulate a system call that will do whatever you like. Uh, you can jump into the text section of the executable binary itself, which is what I'll show you here. That doesn't typically um, get randomized. So it stays in the same place. So that is a one area you can find code to run. You can jump to the PLT, the procedure linkage table we used in quite a few of our exploits here. There's the PLT and the GOT that are both indirect tables that point to a function. So um, it's a place you can go, which will then get you ultimately to LibC on Linux systems. Um, you can jump to ELF's dynamic linker resolver. This will take you to the linker that will connect to shared libraries and even to shared libraries that are not used by this executable, but are used by some other executable, you can still go here and find out where they are and go use that code. Anyway, so that's the point about the NX stack. The NX stack does not prevent buffer overflows. It does not prevent you from writing past the end of a buffer, and it doesn't prevent you from hitting the address and having that address control the instruct instruction pointer. It just limits what you can do with the EIP after you get there, and that's the problem. Um, so it breaks, like almost every defense you'll ever see, this was designed to break the type of attack that was being used at the time, which was putting shell code on the stack and running it. And so instead of making the buffer overflow impossible entirely, they just made it so you couldn't run the shell code that was on the stack, because that's what was happening. But of course, there's always a way to get around it. And the way to get around it was to not put your shell code on the stack, put it somewhere else, or use code that already existed somewhere else. All right, and now this stuff is very easy to play with in Visual Studio C++. So let me bring up my uh, virtual machine and let's look at a bit of this stuff. I don't know why my machine is freezing up on me. They're finally letting me out of there. All right. So let me uh, go here. And I think I'll just start with these ones right here. So let me make my window bigger. And all right, so what I've done here, um, let me make my font bigger. All right, let's go up to here and see if it works. That's not bad. Maybe I'll make it a little bigger yet. Let's try going up to here. All right, so I wrote a program here that demonstrates a lot of these things. Um, this is C++ code, so it uses this thing to call in libraries. 
Now I define an integer here. This is going to be outside main. This is therefore going to go in the data section. That's where these kind of variables go, global variables. And I'm not doing anything with it particularly. I'm just putting it here so I can refer out where it is. Then I'm going to have a local variable and another one called j, and then a pointer called p. And here, I'm just going to do a string copy. Now, one thing that helped me up for a couple of days getting this ready, I finally read the documentation about Windows stack protections. Windows does not turn on these stack protections all the time. When I made a very simple program, it didn't have any of these defenses. Now, what's going on? It actually only puts the stack cookie in when it decides your code looks dangerous. So if you don't have any arrays, or if your arrays are too short or anything like that, they won't turn on the defenses. And I was going out of my mind. I thought I turned that on. Why isn't it on? So I put in something here that just looks like it might be a buffer overflow to full windows. I made a character array of five bytes. Then I copy four bytes into it because I really don't want to do an overflow and crash, but that is enough to scare the compiler into turning on the defenses. You've got to have something a little dangerous looking in your code. And a character buffer longer than four is supposed to be good enough to do it. So that's all this is. It also serves the purpose of making it possible to find my code in Ida Pro by having a string somewhere I can find it, which is, again, my limitation of not being very good at running Ida. I have a real hard time finding anything if there's no readable strings to leave me there. Okay, now I want to find out where the text section is. You remember there was some assembly code we used last time to just look at the, um, the value of ESP, I think. We just copy an assembler. You can't do that with EIP. Here's another fun thing I learned this week. You cannot move EIP into something. You, you can't read it. You can't write to it because there's, it's a special register. You're supposed to control it by using call and return. It's actually kind of hard to see EIP directly. It can be done. But what I did here, this is the easy way. I just put a label here in assembly. So it will label this point of my code. And then I just take the address of that label and put it in a register and put it in this variable D. So now I, the C can see the address of that point in my code. So now I have a mark in the text section, which is all I want. It's not exactly the start of the text section, but it's somewhere in the text section. And now I print that out. Here's the address in the data section. I just print out the pointer to that. The ampersand in C gives you a pointer to that object. And here is an address on a stack. I just define a variable here called I, it's one, and I just print its address here. So that tells me where the stack is, and here's the heap. I create an object on the heap with malloc, and then I print the pointer to it. And then I decided to see the entire stack frame, so I just take the address on the stack, put it in P for pointer, and then I move forward, incrementing pointer by one every time down here. One Another rather strange thing about C++ is that if you increment a pointer, it adds four to the pointer because it adds one data size unit of the size you defined your pointer as. So this will give you the 10 32-bit words on the stack, starting from the place where i is. Not really the start of the stack frame, but where the first variable is, which is, I think, the next word. So that's what I've got here. And uh, if I, I can compile this a couple of different ways. And I think if I compile it normally, which is what I did here anyway. Um, let me just, uh, there. If you want to compile it, uh, I should have it right up here. There. This is how you compile things normally. CL, this EHSC is just boilerplate stuff, and mem.cpp. That will compile it with all Microsoft protections in there. And let me make this font bigger too. Um, edit properties, font bigger. Okay. And so now if you run mem, it prints out all this information. And the fun way to do it is to animate it. So you do clear the screen, ampersand, ampersand mem. It's not a semicolon in Microsoft. It's an ampersand, ampersand to do the same thing. Now, there you are. Now I can just press up arrow and run it again and again and again, and you can see what happens. And I was surprised to learn that the text and the data section never move. Address space of that randomization does not randomize all the segments of a program. It only does some of them. And I think this is all about performance. The same thing is true of stack cookies. I found an article analyzing the cost of stack cookies, and he said they often make code the same or even faster, but sometimes they make it much slower. So I think Microsoft is not willing to just add these protections anywhere where they're not needed. So they try to figure out what protection needs it, and they don't bother moving the text or the data section. And here's the stack. 
here's the one, which is the one of my counters. Here's more variables. Now notice the data section here is at 00426. And you should see some numbers. Remember 400,000 is where Microsoft programs always think they're running at 400,000. So this 403,300 is a pointer to code in the text section. That is, I think, the end of the stack frame. And um, this is probably the return pointer, but I'm not sure. Anyway, you can see what changes. That never changes. This one changes. And somewhere down here is the stack cookie. It's not too obvious here, but we'll play with it a little later. And you can see it in the pointer. So let me um, get, get another one so we can look at this in, uh, in Ollie. So let me, um, I want to add something to this. And I think I've got that in the previous project. So let me open the previous project for reference here. And let's make one of these that will freeze so we can look at it in a debugger. And then we can really see what's going on better. So wherever the projects are, there they are. This one here, I think has the code to freeze. There, that's the code I need. See out, press enter, see and ignore. That's what I, so let me add that to my program here. I'm going to um, copy mem.cpp to memweight.cpp and notepad memweight. Okay, all I'm going to do is at the end of this, I'm going to put in that stuff there. because I want it to stay running instead of coming back right away. There, let's save that. Now I want to compile that one. I'm going to leave all the defenses on. So that is mem, uh, there, mem wait. Okay, now I can run mem wait and but it's just garlic called CPP, all right? I'm at webway.exe, which I can do that. There we are. So now it presses enter to continue. So now I'm going to run it. It's, and I'm going to, although you do it right inside the debugger, it's probably the easiest way to see this. There's a few fun ways to do it. Let's start with the debugger. So let's open memweight. I'm working in the folder 127D. I keep making more and more folders as I fill them with earlier versions of these programs. Okay, so the program is loaded, and now I run it, and run it some more, and now down here on the taskbar, well, I can do it this way. There, I see it's running, and it's printing out information. Now, I can view the memory inside the debugger. There, here's the memory, and I can probably make this smaller. Put it, okay, there we are, that's pretty good. All right, so here are the sections of mem weight. The PE header is here at 100,000. Um, the code is here, notice the 400,000 have been moved up. So the text section is at CB11, way up here. This is address space layout randomization. It's moved it up here. Um, and Here's the data in here. Now the stack is way over here. Notice how this stack is there at 58E, and the stack is here at 588F. That's the data on the stack. And um, the heap is giving me bad food. That's some kind of number it gives you when the, the heap is not working right. Uh, I'm having problems with the heap here. But anyway, you can see it there. Let's reload this program. Debug, restart, yes. And then run and run. So there's data, and now view memory. And now it's at a totally different address, CB1000, but the text is here, and the data is there. Um, all right. And I'm not sure why text is moving here, and text was not moving in the earlier examples. But anyway, you can see it to some extent by looking at it here to see what part of it moves. And we can see the stack cookie in IDA, and we did that last time. So let me make one without these defenses and compare it. That's probably the other thing I want to do here. So let me see if I've done what I wanted to do here in the slide. So there's the code that prints all this. This is what happens when you compile it with protection. You can run it over and over and over, and text and data won't change. Now what happens is they 
were randomized, I think, when I first compiled it. But when you run it over and over, they don't keep, they don't keep changing. We saw that. Right now, I feel like that's a little different than what we saw in the debugger, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. Let's compile it without ASLR. And that is this stuff, CL with slash C, and then dynamic base no. So if I copy the um, mem dot C to mem no ASLR dot C, and then I compile it with CL slash E H S C slash C. Okay, that compiles it, but it does not link it. Now I need to link it with dynamic base. It's in the slides there, but dynamic base, no. Colon, no, I think. Yeah. Okay. And this should be the object that I'm linking. Okay. And now I should be able to run that um, mem no uh, there. And now I should be able to clear and run that. Okay. And now we should be able to watch it go. So now the stack never moves either because I don't have any ASLR. The heap keeps moving, which I think is probably some kind of error in my code to find the heap because often I have a zero there or some really stupid number, which doesn't seem to make any sense at all. So I don't know what that's about. And I don't know how to quiet my phone either. I, phones are too hard to operate. Anyway, um, so here's the stack and that'll, that'll stop ringing at some point. Notice how... I think this is the whole stack frame now running, and I think I've got no stack cookie either. But we'll play with that a little later. You can see it in, um, in the disassembly. You can see the stack cookie. My phone is very nice to look at, but it's too complicated to operate. Anyway, so, um, all right. Anyway, that's the point. All right, that's all I wanted to show you right there, and it's not quite as smooth as it should be, but that will be a project for you to work through. I'm nearly done writing it. It is... Uh, Uh, what, the project? Yeah. Well, I got two of them up. The third one I wrote today, but I'm still working the bugs out of it. Oh, okay. Probably in a couple of days. They're all extra credit. There's a ridiculous number of projects in this class, you probably oh, noticed. Okay. But, um, but I do plan on having it available for you folks to do, because um, I think it's very good to start playing with seeing these protections and seeing how they exactly work. Um, And that's a little ragged, but I am, I do think it's coming together. I now know a lot more about these defenses than I used to. And I want, we will be able to play with them in more detail. My old phone had a switch on the side that would make it shut up. The new one, of course, has to make everything complicated, so. I think I saw some kind of mode called shut up or something in here. Let me try and figure that out. Do not disturb. Okay. All right. Of course, then I forget to turn it on for like three days. It's fine. People who are calling me on the phone would be wise to just give up and use Twitter. Because all it ever is is idiots trying to lie to me about politicians anyway. So every time I answer it, I wish I hadn't. Anyway, so. Yes, they did. Well, it's no longer Halloween. So they had to go back to the normal music. All right. I hope I started the right one. I guess we're going to see. I'll wait a few more seconds. All right.
Okay, which one of these is generic? Return to Lib C is what I've got there. I wonder if return to data really belongs there. I'm doubting my question here. I thought return to data injected to code you put in the data section. Yeah, that's wrong. That's a mistake in that Kahoot. Such is life. This doesn't include that one. Make a note. Whoever wrote these loses a point. Anyway, we'll carry on. I can't change them now. Let's see. So which one uses shellcode paste kind of heap by buffered processor? All right. All right. That's a fair one. Return to data works that way. That's one way to do it. That heap is actually in the data section, at least in that case. I'm not completely clear on exactly what the heap does, as you can see from my code. I, Microsoft heaps are very complicated, and I haven't got to the bottom of them. If I figure it out, it'll be another project. Anyway, um, I wish a cat can use dill that they executable it does not load, which is pretty amazing. That's this one. You can jump to the resolver and go to a dill that's not being used. There was a similar exploit in one of the CTFs I did. There were two vulnerable services, and you would do the first one that would connect to a system call, and you could go to the second one and jump to that address, even though it was not connected to this function. You could still use that system call, which is bloody awesome. Anyway, all of this comes from not enough permissions on memory. If it was files, it was owned by a user and in use and locked and all that jazz, then none of this would happen. But the memory doesn't have any of those defenses. So you can just go use memory that is none of your business. Anyway, so which method would put shellcode on the stack, but actually boots it in a different memory segment? All right, that's return to string copy. That copies it somewhere else where you can hopefully execute it. And which one reads shell code from the standard input? All right, let's return to get. You get the string. All right. And I'm recording the winners such as they are. Although okay, I know who Caitlin is, but I don't know who Big D and T are. Aha, this may be telling me who somebody is. Oh, okay, good, good. I do know T then, good. All right, good. Anyway, so let's um, carry on here. Up. Oh, all right, let's see what this is. Okay, good. All right. Good, thank you. I got some information about who Big D is. All right, so. All right, and so here's another general defense, write or executable. This makes a lot of sense. When I was a beginning assembly language programmer in the 80s, I used to write a lot of self-modifying code. And this is a really terrible idea because um, you can't even write down the program on paper and read it because it changes while it's running. Now, I thought it was awesome because you can build machine language instructions that the hardware doesn't have, which was necessary on 8-bit processors where the assembly language instructions were very few, and very often the one you wanted wasn't there. But they won't let you do this anymore because it's too insane. So you have either writable code areas for things like data, which you're inputting and changing, but you can't execute it, or you have executable code that has to just stop changing so you can actually read it and understand what it's doing. That's the game. So if you obey this rule, you will not be able to inject anything and then run it at all. All right. 
Um, so Linux had this in something called Pax that was considered quite secure, but it never became very popular um, because apparently it was too uh, difficult, too slow. The NX bit is what we have. This is built into the motherboard. So this is the beginning of putting permissions on memory. You now can mark memory non-executable. And this Microsoft calls this data execution prevention. And in client versions of Windows, it is off by default. And in server versions of Windows, it is on by default, which is one of the many reasons why a lot of code runs only on client versions of Windows. When you try to run it on a server version, you'll get errors. Same thing's true of hardware drivers. Microsoft knows that client machines are used by people who don't care very much and often have cheap junk they want to put on and they make it as tolerant as possible of old junk on client versions like Windows 10 and Windows 7, but the servers they make very picky because you really shouldn't be running low quality old junk on your server. It's more dangerous. You can of course adjust that in software. You can set the server uh, performance, to set the server conditions down to the client conditions and vice versa. And there used to be a product until recently called, um, I forget what Microsoft called it. There's a product you put that would just put all the security from a server on your client. Uh, enhanced Mitigation Toolkit, Emmet. They claim they've taken it out of Windows 10 because it's all built in anyway. I don't know how true that is, but it might be true. I know Microsoft has a very, very many defenses and they get very complicated. So it takes a lot of work to understand each one. Anyway, that's the game. So you can still do chain directed code. You can still do return oriented programming. You can use code that's in the executable segments. It doesn't stop you from doing that, of course. And some memory, you can still allocate a memory region with writing and execute permission. It didn't become impossible. It's just not done by the default uh, loader in Windows or the, the programs they give you. Um, so one simple thing you can do is just call this library, call Z set information process that turns this defense off. This is true of almost all Windows defenses. It is possible to turn it off. There is an API call to turn it off. All you have to do is do that API call and it's off. But this one is designed so it requires injecting null bytes. So that be, it might be a little annoying. You might have a little trouble setting that up. That's one thing to make it a little harder. Uh, you can also change a particular memory region with virtual protect. You can change it to allow both of these things. Um, you may remember if you do, in, when we did the uh, adding Trojan code into PuTTY, made a new section, and you could go into Lord PE, you could go into permissions and see that the new section was writable and executable. Uh, you can totally do that. There's nothing to prevent you. It's just not something that happens with the default tools. All right. You can also do this. You can make it writable and then change it to executable after you're done writing it. That would do it too. All right, so you can make a new section of memory like we did in that uh, Lord PE project, which has writable and executable turned on. So, you know, there's always a way around it. And then there's these stack defenses. Stack guard was first and then pro police came out. This is what stack smashing protection is, which you see in Ubuntu Linux and all modern Linux distributions, which are much earlier projects. If you overflow the buffer, it will not let you change the EIP. Before it gets to the EIP, it will hit the canary and the canary will tell it somebody's overrun the buffer and it will quit at that point. The original stack guard only protected the return address, it just put it here. So you could even change the EBP and all the other variables and it wouldn't complain. Um, this was replaced by pro police. And so then you have to talk about what you use for a canary. At first they just use a null canary. It was always the same. And the idea was you wouldn't be able to inject the nulls to put a null in there. But that's not too hard to get around, so that was considered pretty lame. So then they switched to the Terminator Canary, which is 0000, zero, 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 zero FFOD. That contains a zero, a null, an FF, which is end of form or something. It contains a carriage return in the line feed. It contains a bunch of characters specifically chosen for it to be really hard for you to put them in a string, <laughs> hoping that you will not be able to write that value in. So that was a plan. Um, then they switched to a random canary, which I think was the winner. And so that's one issue. Now, Microsoft also uses the ideal stack layout. This is an attempt to rearrange things so that even if you overflow from one variable into another, you won't hit anything too important. So you put everything, um, put all the local buffers at the end of the stack frame so there's less for them to hit. So you don't put um, the canary there and they'll put the buffer at the end. So you can't leak out of one variable into another very well. You put the buffer as close as possible to the canary, so you're likely to hit the canary instead of hitting anything that matters. That's the plan. 
Of course, if you have multiple string variables on the stack, it can't protect them all this way, but it will put them all at the bottom. So all you can do is leak from one string into another string, which hopefully would be less harmful than leaking into those other variables that might be Booleans or something. Um, all right. Uh, they make compromises. They leave some functions unprotected, as we've been seeing. I've been learning the last couple of days. You can make simple programs, and these dimensions don't come on. So that's the problem. Visual Studio only, only um, protects so-called vulnerable arguments. All right. If you have several buffers, you can overflow from one into the next. Um, therefore, you might be able to control a format string, even when the programmer didn't make a mistake with the format string because the format string was in a variable. Um, all right. Uh, and you cannot control the order of the layout in the stack anymore. And some advanced programmers might actually want things in a certain order to do things on the stack, and you can't do that anymore. So this defense would be annoying to people that really want to operate at that level, although most people don't care. Um, all right. Uh, dynamically allocated buffers are always at the top. And even if you do rearrange the argument, still leaking from one argument into the next argument may result in something you can exploit. So this is not a perfect defense by any means, but it does break a category of older exploits that were designed without this. Another thing you can do is ask ERM at address space, load everything in the lowest part of memory so all the addresses start with zero, zero. We've mentioned this in all the exploits so far. You look for a module that doesn't start there because if it does, you can't eject any of those addresses because the null will terminate your input. So this is pretty good. Um, all right. Uh, for us, though, you can inject one null at the end of the string. And since we have little endian addresses, we get to inject all three bytes and then the null at the end. So often, one null is all you need. So this is not as effective on little endian architecture as it would be on big endian architecture. All right. So here's an example. You can still make one call to system by making the last injected byte null. And that will create an account in the, uh, in the password field. So here's how you're defeating um, ASCII armored address space. You're going to have to inject one e, uh, address at the end, and it's going to end with zero. So I, can, that's how I get to inject the 59, the 34, the 12. And even though the null terminates by string, that's enough. I was able to spell out the entire address of this one argument I wanted to go to. All right, uh, the main executable is not put there though. So you can still use code in the main executable and so on and other places. All right, and I think there's no section after this. Let me get rid of this and go back to here. 14B, okay. I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, better wait a bit. All right. All right. Which one puts shared code in low memory? That's ASCII armored address space. Which one causes NOPS to not run? That's 
and X and X is the only thing that could make a knock not execute. Which defense uses carriage return and end of file characters? That's the Terminator Canary. Many Terminator characters. All right. And which one protects the return value but not the stack frame border? There's stack guard that did that. The early one didn't think of that. All right, so Caitlin has won twice. And I don't know who the people are. Face and I'm a face is you, okay. All right. And uh, I might be tip. Let's see who I is. I if this thing would only move. All right. Yep, good. I thought so. Okay, I is tip. Good. Okay. All right. So, all right. Let's get back to here and talk about a bit more of this. All right. So, ASLR is the big one. Um, unfortunately, not all code is randomized, which is emphatically true. Not every segment of an executable is randomized, and many executables don't have it. Um, all right. The problem is it means you're always using a register, keeping track of the base address, and there aren't very many registers in 32-bit windows. So ASLR has a high performance cost in 32-bit windows. So you can defeat it by using um, return-oriented programming. Return to gets would be fine. Uh, this will make the tell it where to put the code, and it will then the, app, the gets function will return to you a pointer to where it put it, so you don't need to know where it is. Um, all right, there's something called Linux gate, which is a system used of pointers to system calls, and that was at a fixed location. And if that's true, that undoes ASLR. There were a lot of information leaking vulnerabilities in various versions of Windows and Linux that made it pretty easy to defeat ASLR. Um, another big one is randomization, which we talked about last time, I think. We went to this last time, didn't we? Um, let me bring up the project. There's one project from last week that's already up, and there's one from this week that's up. Um, and this is one, and let me see, because if, okay, this is the one you saw. The last time you compiled this stuff with C and looked at it in Ida Pro, so you could see the canary. And I think that's all this one is about. So this one here, I should talk about a bit. This is um, 14X. Here what you can do is make a little program which will print out ESP, which is very easy to do in C++, and then press Enter to continue. So when you compile this thing normally, um, you can you do it this way, you'll get all the defenses, and every time you run it, ESP will be in a different place. But if you compile it this way, you turn off dynamic base. So you end up without address space layout randomization, so every time you run it, ESP is always in the same place. And this is, um, I was quite excited when I did this, and I think it was before I saw you last, because I thought I would test the quality of how random is um, ASLR, because I've heard rumors that it wasn't very random. So I uh, made one here. You can install Immunity and Mona. You'll need those. And once you get them, you can open this thing. And then I made the same vulnerability program we've had before, where it takes a password and um, you can exploit it. Anyway, the thing I wanted to show you, which may not be here, here we are. If you make a simple thing here, which just prints out, all right, just a minute, I'm losing my mind. Um, anyway, the point is I made one of these and I'm not, I thought I wrote it in one of these projects where you do this a thousand times and see how random it is. Last week or this week, I um, thought it was in this one, just a minute. Maybe it's part of the one that I skipped over. All right, let me try my new one. Uh, I think what happened is I put it in the new one and then I got delayed by trying to add something else that is taking a lot longer and giving me trouble. So here's the new one that is not published yet. Yeah, the first half of this, uh, this is the one which I haven't shown you yet, is very interesting. I went and I got so confused I went and read the Microsoft documentation, which is an act of sheer desperation. But anyway, let's start here. You make a very simple program that will just do nothing but do assembly to move the ESP into a variable called data and then just print out that value. That's all it does. 
So when you run that, you'll see it keeps on changing because I have ASLR. If you compile it without ASLR, now it's always the same. So now I can test the quality of ASLR as now that I have Python. Since we've installed Immunity, we have Python. And since we have Python, we can easily write a wrapper around this. So here's a program that will do it 10,000 times. Very simple. This is all you have to do. You can run system commands. So that will print it on the screen. And if I run it with a greater than 10k.txt, it will save it in a file so I can look at it. So I run this, and I get a file with 10,000 stack locations in it. And now the question is, how random are they? One simple thing you can do is just see how many of them are different. And again, you can do that in Python. Of course, this is the issue. If something's supposed to be random, how do you know? But so all you have to do, this program will clean it and find only unique values. All you have to do in Python is do the set of lines, and that's the unique value in a list called lines. So when I did that, the answer was there are only 7,000 unique values among those 10,000 values. And I knew this was going to happen because before this, I wrote a simpler version, and I wondered how many times I would have to guess until it hit the same value I got with no ASLR turned on. And I hit that value after like 200 guesses. And I was amazed. That's terrible. I said, so I knew something bad was going to happen. So that's pretty bad. So apparently there are only 7,000 places it can go. And I said, this is awful. I thought it was supposed to be better than that. So I read the Microsoft documentation, and it's supposed to be even worse than that. Microsoft has an advertising arm that makes this stuff sound like it protects you. But when you read their documents, it's mind-blowing. Here's what happens. This is the improved ASLR that you have in Server 2016. Now it's up to 1 in 256 chance of guessing. It's unbelievable. And apparently, I got 6,000 values, so it's more than 256, but it's never very many. These are only things that are more than 4 gigabytes of RAM and only on 64-bit machines and so on. So I, I'm, I'd heard of this 17 bits from a story. It is surprisingly weak. Anyway, somehow I'm not matching this. When I compile it with this 32-bit compiler, I'm getting 6,000 possible values. But still, that's not that hard. So I, what I thought I would do after this project, I'll give you one where I have something running with ASLR protection on my server, and you have to exploit it without a leak by just trying until you get in. And I wrote it, and I got in the first time because the text section is not randomized at all. So it does no good at all. I'm like, wow, man. Anyway, it's, this is the thing about Windows defenses. They sound good until you look at the details. Sort of like those lawsuits. That's why you're like, oh, I'll be fine. Like you say, okay, no classified information. I say, well, in general it is, but you need a lawyer because there are all these details. He said, oh, I forgot to mention that I killed someone to get it. Oh, see, there's always a detail that changes this statement. Oh, you'll be fine. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, anyway, so that one's up. Or No, that's, that's next week. I'll have that up by next week. Um, I'm just working on the second part of it where you can watch the canary change. And I got that working, but it's a little confusing yet. I got to clean it up a little. Anyway, that's the issue. Um, how random is it? And the answer is not as random as it should be. Sometimes as low as 8 bits, sometimes more. Anyway, uh, all right. Um, you can use local privilege escalation. Then you'll be able to see the memory map various ways. Uh, you can also brute force a 16-bit value. Even a 24-bit value is not that hard. If you can try something a million times, and frequently you can try something a million times in computer uh, code. All right, and there are exploits. If there's a format string vulnerability, of course, that lets you read the stack, and there's plenty of addresses on the stack that point to things. Uh, there's a bunch of RPC calls available on Windows that leak memory addresses and handles. If you have multi-threaded applications, then the address space has to be the same for every thread, so that gives you more chances. Unix often uses fork. In fact, until recently, I've heard that every process on Unix is a fork of init. Fork makes two copies of a running process and they can then go off and diverge. But fork does not re-randomize the memory layout. Um, all right, and then there's heap protections. Now we talked about this before. If you have heap items on a heap and you delete the one in the middle, free the one in the middle to be fair, then you have to update pointers at both ends. And those pointers involve numbers that you could have overwritten by an overflow from this heap. So when you have a heap overflow, you end up controlling a write operation. All right. So there are techniques to fix this. One thing is called safe unlink. This is a Windows heat protection in later, more modern versions of Windows. And what it does, before you free the chunk, it makes sure that the previous and next pointers have not been altered. It tries to take previous 
and then come back from next, and it tries to take the next one and come back from previous. So it hops away and hops back to make sure it's okay. So this means you can't just overflow with like capital A's and get away with it. What it means is you have to just choose values that will satisfy this condition, and then you can overflow safely. This is not like a canary where you have to write an 8-bit value that you don't know. All you have to do is point to something and then make sure you can come back. So you can just point like five bytes ahead and then overwrite a value five bytes ahead that comes back and you'll pass this test. So, you know, all it does, again, is stop the code that was written before people knew about this. New code can pretty easily pass this test. All right, that's the game. So it's been around for a while since XP Service Pack 2 and also in Linux. Um, not all heap operations use it, of course, and there are a bunch of techniques. The malloc Maleficarium has a bunch of uh, long, complicated ways to exploit heap overflows. Um, then there's something called unsafe unlinking. Like I say, you can just overflow and then carefully write values that will pass that test, and then you get away with it. Uh, there's a thing called look aside list in a Windows heap. It's more complicated than a Linux heap, and it doesn't have these security checks. So you can write over there, but it doesn't apply to more modern version of Windows after Vista. And there's uh, Windows XP had an 8-bit random cookie in each header, so you'd have to just brute force that. In Vista and later, it's now an 8-byte random header, which is a whole lot harder to guess. Now you're talking about making something impossible. If that's really 8 bytes of randomness, that's a pretty good defense for once, instead of all these lame things. Um, all right. And Windows 8 has even more of them. Uh, complicated things here, fast fail, guard pages, exception handle removal. Like I say, this is Microsoft. What happened here is about eight years ago, Microsoft finally got tired of just trying to tell all the hackers to shut up. And they said, you know, ethical hackers are not that bad. And we're going to like actually be nice to them and have a conference and invite them and pay them money to fix our problems. And their problems, their security got a whole lot better. So these are defenses written by the people that wrote the exploits. They'll pay you 100 grand for the exploit, and they'll pay you another 100 grand if you write the defense. That's moving them forward pretty well. <laughs> That's the way to do it. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, here's even more safe unlinking and all these new defenses here and there. So, you know, the latest version is Windows 8, much better than Windows 7, and I suppose Windows 10 is better too, except it doesn't seem to run at all, but anyway. Um, and many more things, cookies in the kernel pool, and a non-executable kernel pool and supposedly much improved randomization. This is uh, the Ivy Bridge processors now have a hardware random number generator in the processor. So you should be unable to predict the random numbers. There are some extremely cynical people like OpenBSD that refuse to use it for exactly that reason because they assume the NSA poisoned it, which you can never prove they didn't. But Microsoft would totally cooperate if the NSA poisoned it because they're totally interested in selling the government military. So. For them, it's not a problem if the NSA poisoned it, and there is no proof that they have. But this is, I think, part of the huge supply chain argument that we've seen with that latest Bloomberg article. If you build a computer and software, you take a bunch of chips from China, a bunch of components from who knows where, you have a bunch of code and libraries that you didn't write, and how do you know you can trust this stuff? And the answer is, there's no way to tell, really. You're trusting a whole lot of stuff other people wrote that you can't possibly audit. And that is a supply chain problem. It's a huge one, and nobody has a good answer. Anyway, all right, and we talked about the problem with not being random enough, and here's some people that can't trust FreeBSD, refuse to use it, um, because of Snowden, which is, but Snowden's not alone, by the way. There were like three people before him. Um, there were whistleblowers before him, and before him there were cases where we caught the NIST lying to us about the security of computer code to the NSA could hack into things. It is unfortunately not far-fetched to imagine that when the government approves something, that means it's no longer trustworthy. Uh, there's a famous quote, I think, from a French diplomat from a while ago who said, you could never believe anything until the government has officially denied it. So, and Windows 10 has even more defenses um, with SMB signing for network connections and this um, UEFI secure boot, which will not let you alter the kernel. Yeah. Does the NSA use on That's a good question. What does the NSA use on their own computers? And the answer is nobody can tell you. And if they tell you, they would be shot. That, I'm sure that's top secret. They probably have a lie to tell people. Um, I know that um, security enhanced Linux was designed to meet military requirements. Um, I 
It's a very good question. I can tell you this though. Um, Edward Snowden used PGP to leak those secrets out. He told people that he trusted PGP. To, so that is a pretty strong recommendation that PGP correctly implemented, even the NSA can't get in, which was the whole point of it. The problem is it is so hard to use that even the people that invented it have quit using it. It's, but if you go to all that bother, you can totally send secrets and nobody's gonna get them in by reading what's on the wire. They will just have to break into your house and steal the paper or something. It's not like there's no way to get it, but they aren't gonna get it off the computer wire. Anyway, um, so that's secure boot. We'll stop root kits and um, there's more and more versions of trusted boot and user level malware has got various defenses beyond it, Azure Space Layout and Data Execution Prevention. Microsoft keeps adding more and more defenses as they have more and more attacks. Um, your smart screen is one that led to a lot of controversy. Uh, now, every time you go to a website, Microsoft first sends the URL up to their servers so they can test it to make sure it's not known to be malicious before they let you go there. So people ran Wireshark on their new Windows 10 and they said, Microsoft is spying on everything I do. And well, they sort of are, yes. They say they're not recording it or using it to target ads or anything. They're testing it for malware. But of course, you know, there was a time long ago, like in the days of Windows 95, when you would buy software in a box on a floppy and you put it on your machine and there was no internet involved. But now everybody is using a cloud constantly. So if you like open a game and play it and you ask what computer is running this game, the answer is it's not that simple. Part of it's on your machine, part of it's in your router, part of it's on a remote server, part of it's on another remote server. Everything we do is actually many machines working together. And if you want to be sure that your confidential stuff is not going to some other machine, this is getting harder and harder to know these days. It's the same issue of companies when you start being secure and you say, all right, here's the first question. You have this all important thing you make, like your proprietary information, intellectual property. How many copies of that are there and where are they? Most people are stumped when they begin adding up how many copies there are. I really don't know. It's on the server. It's on my desktop. It's on my phone. It's in this guy's Dropbox. It's on these USB sticks. Now that you mention it, I don't know where it is. It's all over the place as well. You can't really secure it until you somehow can say you know where it is. And the same thing happening here anyway. So, um, all right, Edge, there's this enhanced protected mode with sandboxing in the browser that Microsoft is touting. And in the very latest thing last week, now the Microsoft antivirus engine is in a sandbox because many, uh, mainly Vincent Tavizzo at Google has had a great time exploiting antivirus engines. He's been murdering them for the last five years because they snatch the malware and they typically run it in something like a virtual machine to see if it's malicious. So all you have to do is take over the AV and then you're in. And that's a big problem. And Microsoft is the first one to put their AV in a sandbox to try to put a barrier there. Um, remember one of my students got a job securing, uh, I think Adobe PDF, when they decided to, before the sandbox, they hired a team to like try to patch their code, which was famous for being insecure. And I. I felt like I should probably uh, not congratulate this student because the first bunch of security people you send at a big problem that your company is trying to deny are like the people you send across a minefield to find out where the mines are. They're gonna just get fired for failing to fix it. And they'll be the ones that convince you to finally pay what it costs to actually fix it. <laughs> because okay, look, uh, you don't have a budget to really rewrite all the code. Just put a couple of patches in and fix this problem. It's like, when that's never gonna work. You gotta start over and do it right. Anyway. So uh, PHK malloc is what they used without linked lists a while ago, uh, but now it uses mmap, which gives you randomly located chunks of RAM in the heap to try to stop your chunks from being adjacent. So when you overthrow a chunk, it doesn't go to the next chunk. So now the information used to rewrite the pointers is not the information you were able to overwrite. That's a pretty good way to make it very difficult to understand how you could accomplish a heap overflow. Um, and it's getting quite difficult but there are sometimes other targets you can shoot for in the uh, metadata around the heap. And then there's the structured exception handler, which we exploited in some of the projects. Um, it used to be for a while that one of the registers always had a pointer to the SEH, which made it very easy to get there. So Microsoft now zeroes registers before you go in there so that the code you write will not have access to that information. You can't put the handler in the stack. Um, safe SEH forces you to use a whitelist to permitted exception handlers and it blocks trampoline attacks because you cannot jump into the middle of a, of a function. 
you have to jump into the start of the function. This is a general fixed all return oriented programming. You have to really use functions in their entirety. You can't jump in three instructions before the end to just get a pop pop ret, which is what you want to do. Really, why would you ever let anybody enter your function except at the official start point? That doesn't make any sense. That would be pretty easy to do, and that would greatly limit your ability to build attacks. Um, all right. And of course, then there's uh, exploitation tools out here. E-Reap is one of the things that will do what Mona does. It will hunt through and find trampolines. Um, and here's a couple others that will tell you what SEH inspector will tell you which defenses are on and list valid exception handlers. All these things we're doing with Mona inside Immunity, but there are other tools to do similar jobs. All right. And we're here at the last Kahoot. Now what I'm planning to do with the next project is you have the stack there. I'm going to get to where you see the stack cookie and we're going to make a bunch of like thousand measurements of the stack cookie to see how random it is. It's supposed to be all super random, but we might as well find out. It's very good to test these things because very often they are not what they appear to be. There may be another student or two that hasn't fallen asleep yet. Then again, maybe not. I'll give it another few seconds. All right, which one lets you specify where to put cell code? Cell code. Gets, puts it where you want it. You specify the address. That's the parameter into get. Get data from the keyboard and put it in this variable. You feed in that variable. All right. Which one puts function pointers in a predictable location? As Linux gate. One of the several lookup tables used to find functions. Which one is supposedly poisoned by the NSA? Or people are afraid of it. I've not seen any evidence that this is true. RD Rand, the hardware random number generator. So how many guesses will it take to find two 8-bit values? Two fifty six squared. Two fifty six is one eight bit value. Another one means you two fifty six squared sixty five thousand. All right. This is why people thought it was okay to have a sixteen bit value in DNS to identify DNS responses. The problem is Dan Kaminsky figured out how to guess five hundred at a time. And if you can guess five hundred at a time, guessing sixty five thousand gets a whole lot easier. All right. So there's Caitlin. For nine, and the face is tip, I imagine. Okay. It's you. Okay, good. All right, we're good. Then that's uh, they are in there twice, and Leandro Silva looks like a real name. All right, so I know these people, and I've talked about a couple projects. Let me see if there's another project I should mention before I quit. Um, that would be here. We've done. Um, This one here, I think we talked about. Here's where you do Windows executables. Yeah, this is where you, I think we already talked about this one. 
You use Mona to make the ROP chain. And I'll just point to it so hopefully it ties into what we're doing here. You have a, um, a vulnerability where you get to inject code onto the stack. And you have DEP turned on, so you can't use the code you've injected in the stack, so you have to prefer a stack pivot here. And Mona will totally do it for you. If you just tell Mona to find return-oriented programming chains, it will find them, and that's what they look like. Um, this is the code that uses the virtual protect system call to a virtual protect API call to turn off the defenses that are stopping you from running that code on the stack. So that's all it is. And it's just called a whole, these are the register setups. This series of registers will do. Then you end up pop, drop, knop to return. And then, so here's the Python code that does it. It's just a series of calls. Each one of these is pop, return, move, pointer, pop, return, pop, return. So each one of these is jumping just a couple of instructions be at, before the end of code. And by pasting together those little bits, you build what you need. And so even though you can't execute code, you can put all these addresses on the stack and they're used for the EIP. And the code that executes is elsewhere. So that's the game. And it works pretty well. The only hard part about this one is the indentation. You have to be careful because the indentation created by Mona is different than the indentation of the code you typed in. And indentation matters in Python. So students get stuck because of indentation. But that's the only trick there. Um, it used to be very burdensome. It used to take like half hour to do fine prop chains, but modern hunters like Mona are very fast and nice. In just a couple minutes, it finds good prop chains. All right. And I think, so I guess that's enough. Uh, these are the ones that are going to go deeply into these defenses. Two of them are ready. The third one's coming up, which will be about stack cookie. And I may have another one coming, depending on how, how much of this stuff is fun. It's nice to be able to make little simple C programs that can use to test it. I guess that's it, unless there are any questions. I'll just quit. I'll go to the lab for a while and see if anybody wants help today. Uh, next week, I think the class is at three because of a contest. So don't come at one or you will be disappointed. I'm gonna end the meeting. All right.